Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me is former Los Angeles County District Attorney Steve Cooley. Steve, thank you so much for joining me. Well, happy to do so. We had a really historic 48 hours in that time. President Joe Biden dropped out of the 2024 race and Vice President Kamala Harris is now the likely Democratic nominee. You and uh, Vice President Kamala Harris do go way back. You ran against each other for uh, California Attorney General back in 2010. So first, what was your reaction to this news? I think it was predictable and I think it's unfortunate. She is wholly unqualified. She is an embarrassment to this country. Those are strong words. What makes you say them? She was a lousy district attorney in San Francisco. She was generally an inept uh, attorney general, except she did, in one stroke of a pen, create criminal havoc in California by mistitling uh, uh, Prop 47. Uh, as the Safe uh, Neighborhoods and Community Act, when all it did was lower penalties for serious theft offenses and take hardcore drugs from the status of being a felony to a misdemeanor. All of that in turn created the mess that California's in, including its homeless problem. So she is a big uh, cause through that decision to mistitle Prop 47. She's a big cause of a lot of our problems. I understand that you were both district attorneys at the same time, her in San Francisco, you in Los Angeles County. Can you describe what your personal relationship was like with her? What was it like working with her? Get into detail about that. I would say it was professional. Um, as an elected district attorney, you have to represent your office and your constituency, and you have to make things work. So we were on the California District Attorneys Association together. Uh, we went to meetings together, uh, and uh, on one occasion, uh, we uh, worked on the uh, uh, California's version of a human trafficking law. Uh, she proposed it. We reviewed it and found that it was incredibly poorly written, that they had cut and pasted from federal law and not adapted uh, the proposed legislation to California law. So we helped her out. Uh, my staff, very smart people, uh, figured it out and fixed it for her. So can you describe what it was like running against uh, Vice President Kamala Harris? Then at the time you both were running for California AG. Well, um, I don't know if you know about the facts of that particular election, but uh, you know, California is a very blue state. Uh, I uh, started out uh, sort of in a hole uh, in terms of the electorate. Uh, there were 20% uh, less Republicans registered than Democrats, so she started out sort of ahead. Uh, at the end of the campaign, there had been 57 law enforcement endorsements. I got all 57. There were 18 newspaper, daily newspaper endorsements. I got 17. So I really did close the gap from being uh, in sort of a Republican hole uh, to basically winning the night of the election, uh, but which would within one percent state law mandated that every ballot had to be counted, and they were over the next three weeks. So all the provisional votes, you know, those that are harvested and then dropped off at uh, our polling uh, locations, were counted, and she beat me by uh, point three tenths of one percent after they were all counted. So it was close. I want to talk about how that race really was an outlier back in 2010, because in the governor's race, Democrat Jerry Brown beat Republican Meg Whitman by 13 points. In the Senate race, Democrat Barbara Boxer beat Republican Carly Fiorina by 10 points. And in the AG race, as you said, Vice President Kamala Harris beat you by less than one percentage point. So what do you think you did and your campaign did to peel away some of that Democrat support? I think that the closeness of that campaign <clears throat> was uh, partly a recognition. I'd done a pretty good job as DA of LA County, even though I was Republican. And secondly, a lot of people that knew Kamala Harris did not like Kamala Harris. And that was evidenced by the um, uh, newspaper endorsements, which I got 17 of 18, and law enforcement endorsements, because the AG's office is considered a top law enforcement job in the state. 
Uh, there are 57 endorsements. I got all 57. So in a very grassroots way, people that knew her didn't like her or didn't support her. I think that's where the uh, that margin was made up. You're saying that you received a lot of support from law enforcement in this election. As we saw yesterday when she made a speech, she's portraying herself and this election versus Donald Trump as the prosecutor versus the felon. What do you make of that strategy? First of all, I don't think uh, having watched that particular prosecution, it was uh, a joke as a prosecution against Trump. Uh, it was made up to attack him, to hurt him disable him as a candidate. Put that aside. Her being a prosecutor, uh, I think it's sort of a misnomer. Yes, she was a uh, prosecutor at the Alameda County DA's office for a while. Uh, her boss then, her, her district attorney, told me, who supported me, that she was lousy. She was kind of inept. She went to San Francisco. She was very ambitious. She wanted to have a high rank in San Francisco, even though she was relatively new over there. Uh, and Terrence Hallinan did not give her that high rank. She then decided to run against Terrence Hallinan with her dear friend Willie Brown's support, and she won that race. But as a prosecutor, I doubt if she's done uh, more than a handful of trials. This is not a quote unquote real prosecutor. Real prosecutors try a lot of cases, uh, and they spend a lot of time in the courtroom learning that craft, developing their skills, uh, and becoming better and better. She never spent that much time learning the craft or developing her skills as a prosecutor. So I think that's uh, a term that's been used by many, such as Adam Schiff and others, that I think is a misnomer. Uh, and I think that uh, in the future, her lack of prosecutorial skills will be demonstrated very clearly. You were her opponent, obviously, not inside of her campaign. But from your vantage point, how does she run a campaign? Well, uh, I thought her campaign was actually pretty effective uh, against mine. She did do uh, her campaign, did very well when it came to social media. That was an emerging craft in, in politics at the time. She had a lot of support in S Silicon Valley that helped her in that arena. So I thought that was something that they, that they did very well. Uh, my campaign consultant advised, and I followed his advice, that uh, you can't be too harsh on a female candidate uh, or especially a female uh, candidate of color. So just be, don't, don't be too hard, Steve. And I kind of followed that advice, uh, which I think was good sound advice at the time. Um, and uh, overall, um, I, I think the reason I did as well as I did actually winning election night uh, was because so many people in California knew her and didn't like her, including Governor Jerry Brown. Governor Jerry Brown told me directly he was voting for me because he did not like Kamala Harris. You keep bringing this up, her likability, and throughout the Biden presidency, her approval rating often trailed behind his, and it wasn't that high. What makes you say that she wasn't likable? Oh, uh, <laughs> from what I've heard from many sources, her interactions with other human beings is that she is arrogant and an elitist. Uh, and I've also heard uh, over the years, including recently, that she blames her staff for what are oftentimes her own uh, failings or mistakes. And that she goes through staff um, uh, more often than say the average elected official uh, or, or a candidate. Steve. It's her personality. Steve, there's less than four months between now and Election Day. Obviously, this election has been shaken up tremendously. What are you looking out for next? Well, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, it's uh, it's been quite a roller coaster. Uh, it was a roller coaster before President, before the assassination attempt on, on President Trump. Uh, there's the Biden yes, Biden no, Biden's in, Biden's out stuff. So I think that... Uh, uh, based upon what's happened so far, uh, I, I think it's almost like anything can happen, except one thing will not happen. She will not win. She will not win because over time, she'll get more exposure and the voting public will be able to uh, evaluate her objectively. She's going to be scrutinized heavily. 
and I don't think it's going to do well for her. She did break fundraising records in the 24 hours since President Biden dropped out. What do you make of that number? Because $81 million in 24 hours, that's huge. That's huge. And uh, she'll need every penny of it to do well in this campaign. She'll need every penny. And that's a reaction, I think, from um, the uh, major Democrat donors and the diehards who really do uh, want to defeat uh, President Trump. Uh, I don't think it's so much just about her per se. Uh, it's about uh, they're very committed to defeating President Trump. They don't like him uh, for their whatever their reasons are, or they perceive that they will be disadvantaged in the future if they don't have the White House uh, uh, connection. So I think that's what that uh, manifests. Plus, anytime you sort of start something out, there's a bump. When you announce your candidacy, there's a bump. If you do well in a debate, there's a bump. She got a bump, a nice bump. Well. Steve Cooley, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining me today. All right, my pleasure. Thank you.